Hello, welcome back everyone. I hope that you're ready for the final panel session of the morning. On this panel, we'll be discussing the subject of learning from experience. How do you identify an attack? What do you do when attacked? And how do you recover from an attack? Those that have been through this ordeal know the hard way. So this is all about sharing some of those experiences so that organisations across the public sector can learn from those that have been through a cyber attack uh, so that they can be best prepared and know what to do in the event of an incident should it happen. Uh, here to talk about their experiences are Councillor Richard Cook, who is the leader of Gloucester City Council, Tom Reeve, who is chair of Surbiton Neighbourhood Committee at Kingston Council. We have Curtis Toy, a virtual chief information security officer and CEO of Onca Technologies Limited, who's also been appointed as the convener of the Cyber Centre of Excellence. And finally, Professor Manos Panousis, who is Professor of Cybersecurity at the University of Greenwich. Um, we've been getting lots of questions throughout the morning, so please do keep them coming. Uh, you can use the Q&A box and I'll keep an eye on those questions and hopefully put them to our speakers. And um, so I thought, let's just jump straight in uh, with this panel uh, with learning from experience. Uh, and Richard, let's go to you because obviously you experienced an incident, a cyber breach. What actually happened in your incident? Well, it was a classic supply chain spear phishing attack, attacking through our supply, ch uh, our supply chain. One of the companies that we did business with uh, had already been uh, hacked. They didn't tell us and the uh, the hackers managed to get uh, into our systems uh, through uh, through email conversations and, and you know what what happened when you realized that you've been hacked well it takes some time to realize what's happened and the scale of the attack um we immediately contacted the experts the ncsc and the nca um we were provided with a list of forensic investigators um uh, and then uh, they started to help us. Um, others have been there before. Uh, we leaned on them for help. Hackney, Redcar and Copeland are other councils that have been uh, hacked in this way. Uh, and the LGA are also there to help. And of course, uh, CCOE uh, are now uh, uh, very able to uh, give us uh, assistance as well. And in, that, in those moments of vulnerability for your system, what was the impact? Well, our systems were um, encrypted, so we couldn't use them at all. Uh, we had no, essentially no IT for the best part of a year until we managed to rebuild those systems altogether and had to create workarounds to, uh, uh, to be able to supply residents with the services that they needed from us. Thank you. And, um, you know, we'll get on to what you did then in terms of recovery. Um, but just to bring in our other speakers and panellists, um, Curtis, have you got um, any recent incidents that you can discuss that people can learn from? Yeah, there have been a couple, actually, and they were very similar to what's happened for, for Richard and, and Gloucester. So the, rather than systems being attacked from the supply chain, it was almost like a, a different breed of phishing attack where the supplier of um, the, the business was hacked and they weren't made aware of it, that it was an email compromise. So effectively the attacker became fully in control of the user's email address. They then sat in the middle, didn't make themselves known whatsoever on the, on the supplier's database at all. Um, there was no alerts raised, they just sat there for months um, and then set up auto forwarding rules now and again, basically pulling in the information that was relevant to them they started working out exactly who to target for high-end invoices. So this happened with a client who has, was, the invoice was in the region of about £250,000. Um, and instead of making them be aware or encrypting systems, instead they just hijacked the email chain and then started emailing to the, to the end client um, who, was, who should be paying the invoice and highlighted that bank details were changed. Unfortunately, the end client team did not pick up that this was odd. They realized that they should verify it, but unfortunately verified via an email to the same email address, not realizing that that email address had been compromised. They just didn't have a clue that that was, that was a possibility. So obviously for lessons learned, pick up the phone, speak on Teams directly if you can. But this, uh, this didn't continue. This didn't just stop there. It continued over about six months. So it was a few invoices they actually managed to have, have paid. Um, and obviously the, the, the client I was speaking to weren't the only ones affected by the supplier. So the supplier is now down 
a huge amount of money because they're, they're still waiting to be paid from clients that have already paid the money. Um, and this is happening quite increasingly across small businesses. So it's, it's kind of having a chain, chain reaction. Yeah, thank you for outlining that. And it really shows the ripple effect um, and how long how long it can last. Uh, Tom, um, at Kingston Council, what lessons have you learned about cybersecurity? Yeah, well, um, I've, I've only been at um, Kingston Council for a year and a half. And, and fortunately, I can uh, I can say that uh, we uh, we have a uh, touch wood, not, uh, not been the victim of a, um, a cyber attack. Um, so I don't have the direct experience of cyber attacks, but um, I have been a, um, a cybersecurity um, journalist um, for a, a number of years um, and uh, learned quite a lot about the, uh, the incidents and the vulnerabilities uh, that we're dealing with. And in my new role as a counsellor, um, I've begun to ask questions uh, about how um, council, you know, our council and councils in general address the issue of uh, cyber security. Uh, and unfortunately, I sit on the, the audit and governance committee where I can, I can ask uh, some of those questions. And I, I think it's very important for us as councillors to begin to understand what kind of questions we need to be asking um, of our IT teams um, in order to reassure, you know, to give ourselves that reassurance um, that the issues um, and the vulnerabilities that we're, we're hearing about today um, are, are being addressed. And so what I tend to do is I, I tend to keep an eye on, you know, what are the high profile events that are being reported um, and what kind of lessons um, uh, can we learn from, from those that might be applicable to our situation. That's great. Thank you, Tom. And I have already had a question come through, which I will come to in just a minute. But I'd just like to bring Manos in um, just to get a sense of, you know, we can obviously we're hearing already the scale of some of the, you know, the unraveling that can happen when there is a cyber attack. So in terms of, you know, investing in cybersecurity, are decisions about those investments challenging at the moment? Uh, yeah, sure. That's, that's a very good question. I think there are a few challenges there that they are more prominent than others. Uh, for example, the dynamic threat landscape. We see the attack and um, surface changing, but the attackers are changing as well. They have right now in the possession some really good tools, including LLM-based um, applications, generative AI applications, and this, you know, um, generates the need for quite a lot of monitoring and continuous change, which is challenging, I think, for, for public government with so many different at so many different levels of governance there. Um, a resource allocation definitely is a problem. So challenge, um, how do we balance a limited budget and the risk tolerance? If we invest too much in, in security controls then may not um, get a good return on investment. If we invest less, we may not have such a good security. It's needless to say about the human factors and social engineering. That was the case in Redcar um, and Cleveland, where they download uh, an attachment um, in, a, in a council laptop. Uh, we heard something similar here. We also heard that the fourth uh, challenge, we heard about supply chain. You have software vendors who you trust or service providers who you trust. And as a result of that, it can become um, let's say compromised and then infect the, the public government. Um, I wouldn't um, ignore the uh, technology complexity, but how do we assess what we did? So if, if the council, for example, implements some controls, how do we know how good they are? So this, this needs a thorough exercise. And how do we um, integrate these controls, the new controls that we're planning to, to, to have with existing infrastructure? I think the last one is quite but interesting um, that I have here, it's about um, the implementation of new technologies like generative AI. So I'm pretty sure we're going to experience uh, new applications coming in based on LLM technologies. This can become uh, compromised in various ways, including um, prompt ejection attacks and other attacks that are probably well known. Um, and how do we teach people how to use this, uh, these tools? One thing. and how do we enable security within the tools themselves? Of course, that's not just for uh, public government, but it's definitely something that uh, the latter will, will face in the, uh, in the near future. 
Yeah, and I think human behaviour is a really interesting uh, point to pick up on in terms of learning because that's where this question has come in. So I'll put to the whole panel, if anyone feels they can answer it, um, I'll go to you. Um, but um, after we've had this question that's come through. Human factors side of cybersecurity is very important and cyber awareness is only a small part of the solution. Are there any recent developments in terms of understanding the human side of the issue? I guess it's how you're working, you know, working with people. Is there anyone that feels they can answer that? I can take, I can take part of it, certainly. So, so with, with some of the stuff that we've been doing within the Cyber Centre of Excellence recently, we've found it quite useful. We've been doing a number of pilot projects with different councils, public bodies and, and different, um, different organisations to look at how we can best put together solutions for everybody. And one of the things that we've come across is a ransomware simulation. So I think it's not just you're talking about the training and often, you know, when we, when we speak about training, we immediately go to things like phishing training or looking at exactly the types of things you should be looking for. We don't often do the training for the part after. What happens if you do click? What happens if you do have ransomware? How do you respond to that? So it's really important to make sure that you do have scenario based training. Um, not just for your IT team, so round the table exercises are really, really key, um, but also for testing the response to your staff. Um, it's all well and good asking them to complete policies, etc. And you think you know how they're going to react, but actually having a kind of ransomware simulation in, in tandem with phishing simulations and training is really useful so that actually you can see how do they react to this and start to create it like a fire drill. You know, we hear a fire alarm, we know immediately we need to leave the building. We need to become as quick with that as, as we do for ransomware. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, Tom. Yeah, I, I mean, I hear the, the, the interest in, you know, human factors, um, but I would, um, mark, I would caution against focusing too much on human factors, because a lot of times what happens is we end up tending to blame users, we, you know, we get to the situation of blaming users uh, for an attack that's really, um, it part is more of an endemic issue. Uh, for the, the, the you know the systems um, overall, and we need to have we need to have proper uh, systems that you know can isolate um, you know human error, um, but also support users um, effectively. Uh, so I think you know training, um, as we're talking about, can only go so far. We've got to have the systems to back people up. Mm. Brilliant, thank you. Um, let me go back to you, Richard, because I guess it ties in, you know, as, as a council that has actually experienced a breach, I wonder, um, you know, what was your communication strategy during the response period? And how well do you think it worked now looking back? Well, on the advice of the NCA, we were very guarded and cagey about releasing any information about the incident and have maintained a near regular silence for the whole time. We don't even use the word attack, but call it an incident. Um, only information that was provided on the public website was to describe the impact on council services and what citizens should do to work around. Uh, we also had very limited communication to councillors and staff. Um, recently, uh, which is now 18 months later than the attack, we've only just started talking publicly about what happened as we've agreed with the information commissioners offices to make a statement to make the public aware of the data breach. We stood up a dedicated email, phone line and team to answer potential, uh, potential spate of calls. But in the end, we only received two inquiries from the whole of Gloucester. Uh, on the whole, we think this communication strategy worked well for us. And the response and the reaction from the public was measured and largely sympathetic. And I guess overall, you know, what, what are the learnings for you following on from as you called it an incident well it's it's a matter of when not if for most of us it's going to happen there are i don't know curtis would probably answer better than i but i believe there are hundreds of thousands of uh, attacks hacking attacks on councils every every day um, so protect as best you can but practice business continuity and delivering services without systems uh, most business continuity plans assume IT systems are only going to be down for a matter of days. How many have con continuity plans to deliver services without IT systems for a year? Um, and the weak link in our business continuity planning was the services provided for us by our partner councils uh, who we did uh, joint business with. We had problems because they cut us off uh, fearing contamination uh, and that made our uh, delivery of services even more difficult. 
so we've learned quite a lot from it, um, um, but I think uh, we've managed to get through it all quite well. Thank you, uh, Richard. I've actually just had a comment come through, which is sort of a, a question, but also just a, a comment too. Um, uh, Abiola says, uh, attackers have an advantage, maybe because companies and individuals are less likely to share their experience of attacks owing to fines by ICO slash other government bodies. And, and um, let's say we need an agency that allows companies and individuals to share information secretly. I mean, I don't know if that's something that you think needs to take place or there needs to be kind of a, a better way of sharing information um i'm not sure that there is a better way of uh, doing it than we're currently doing it i don't think it's possible for um, a council such as gloucester to hide the fact that we've lost all our systems um we have uh, in the end um, uh, been uh, given a slap on the wrist by the information commissioner's office uh, but uh, so far no fine for which we're rather grateful because uh, this was a very sophisticated attack it was a human as usual which was the weak link in the chain um, somebody who followed a link that um, uh, you know they trusted implicitly but uh, which was actually the uh, uh, the person sitting in the middle who uh, managed to infect our systems uh, it's usually humans who uh, who are the weak link. I don't think there's anything that we could have done and I don't think there's any other changes that we could have made which would have um, sorted out the system any better than we actually did. Okay, Manos, I saw you wanting to, to say something. Yeah, sure, that, that's that's quite interesting, thinking about sharing information, but at the same time, I think we need to think about prevention and focus on the human again. Yes, of course, we don't blame humans, I'm not saying this. I'm saying that if we do the best we can do in terms of security controls, then the other way to uh, go forward is to empower the human. And what do I mean by this? If we look at security as the health science in a way, who is really training every day, <laughs> right? So do we expect our employees to, to detect attacks every day and to, to report them somewhere? We have to think about the balance. Do we train them once a year? Uh, do they remember that something can go wrong and lose 10 million pounds and have one year the council or any other organization in the public government uh, suffering? How was the um, wanna cry happen? So people must remember that there is something there, right? Um, if we talk about smoking, just to say this funny thing, if we talk about smoking, you can see some kind of cancers on the packets, right? how can we have this attitude in organizations including the public government because everybody's like oh okay it's fine someone else is looking after my security and i know i don't have to click on on emails etc but when the other is busy when the person is busy they can do something that they shouldn't so training is very important and of course security controls in general i cannot ignore what um what tom mentioned earlier that okay what if a human makes an error what do we do after so we have to think about these controls too, especially with the, with the new AI um, applications coming in. We're going to be used a lot. And the same way we'll secure the AI applications, we can start thinking how we, we can secure the victimized human. I don't have the answer now, but um, it's definitely things we can do. So were you going to say something? Oh, I, I was just, I, just interesting. Manos mentioned um, WannaCry. Um, I just you know because that was obviously a, a um a, something that um took down a large part of the nhs um uh, until it was uh, uh until it was patched but i mean the fundamental problem there was that the nhs was still operating windows 95 computers um if you don't provide if you don't provide the right equipment for people to work with um then you know you're you're setting them up to fail and we have to make sure that we do provide them with the with the right equipment and the right backup um, but yeah i take but i take manus's points yeah right. you see this this equipment that you mentioned tom shows that okay do we really care so do we have the latest we can have because if you have the latest controls let's say and you really pay attention then humans will catch up you lead by example let's say you know now i'm just asking um, would they know exactly 
um, what the situation is in public government right now. Right now, but I'm sure that leading by example is a good way to make people aware of, of uh, um, security threats and the impact mainly. Not the threats. People are, don't probably care so much about the technical aspects of of the of the attacks, but the impact is massive, and then they can start thinking how to to contribute to, to the prevention of of, um, of the exploitations. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think I think it's definitely we need we need to have a partnership between the users and the um, and the systems in order to secure our system. You know, in order to achieve real security, but they, they we need to uh, to to recognise that it is a partnership. That's great. We, we had you. an experiment in Greenwich, just to say that, um, where humans detect just very briefly, humans detect more attacks than uh, our um, uh, spam filters. Uh, so, um, like a, a link on a on a website, it was a kind of a coffee shop website, a well known uh, yeah. brand. And humans detect more attacks. Of course, it was an experiment, then they knew they have to detect the attack. They were not during their you know um, daily schedule. They they right. were there to detect attacks. Just not security experts. Just you know employees. No, no IT people. We, yeah. have the, we have the capacity is I guess what you're saying, but I guess they were primed in this particular instance to, to be watching. And um, I'm just going to move on to a, another question that's come in, but it's kind of building on this idea of, of, of humans really being part of, I don't know if problem's the right word, but um, Sally was saying, um, you know, blame can be an important part of breaches being reported. Do you agree? Can employees, employees be fired if blamed? So I guess it's about the consequences once you realise that a human is at the heart of it. Um, yeah, over to you, Curtis. I think I can see you putting your... So I've, I've, had, I've had this kind of happen a lot within uh, within boardroom situations where we've done phishing simulations to try and identify, you know, where the, where the kind of company is sitting and how, how likely it would be for them to get an attack. And we've had some um, quite bad results where it's been, you know, 60% of the organisation fell for a phishing, phishing attack. And then the board told me, well, that's because I made it too difficult to spot. And that's kind of... Kind of the point isn't it so that's uh, that's the kind of play on it the difficulty you've got is as soon as you start creating a blame culture then you end up creating a culture that people will just cover things up what we need to do is have a culture where people know they can say yep my fault my bad quick help because the faster they do that the faster you're able to contain it and prevent it nobody is going to raise their hand and say yeah that was me if they think that then they're going to lose their job from it so you might have somebody who's done it, but they will then probably become your most secure person within the company afterwards. Human factor is a big problem, can also be a very big part of the solution. Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. Yeah, Richard. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to say I 100% agree with uh, what Curtis just said there. The blame game is not, uh, not going to work. Um, but we do at Gloucester now take this very seriously, and we do actually... Um, um, test our employees regularly by sending out potential phishing um, um, phishing emails and just see who notices that uh, that it's um, a spoof email or actually follows the link that they shouldn't follow so we actually do periodically trip up not only our employees but also our counselors um, by uh, uh, by playing that game with them um, we don't do it very frequently because we don't want to waste their time, but we do do it often enough and find enough people who are prepared, to, who are unprepared for it and who do um, follow a link that they shouldn't have done. Uh, so we are actually in that way testing people and making sure that when they when they notice that they've um, uh, fallen for the trick, that they recognize that they can immediately say, oops, I, I did it, I made the mistake, uh, so that they're uh, admitting it as fast as possible. Uh, and uh, I think that helps. Mm, that's really interesting. And Rich, I wonder from your experience, do you, do you think there's more that government could do to help councils you know, to protect um, everything in, in the future, really? Well, I think um, one of the first things we need to do as, as councils is develop a sort of self-insurance model for the entire sector. Uh, it would be a poor use of taxpayers' money for everybody to put millions of pounds into um, reserves to protect ourselves from these events. And if you consider that, um, I don't know the exact figure for, uh, that Gloucester spent, but it's not far from a million pounds. I know that um, um, the Hackney uh, attack 
they spent over 10 million pounds recovering from it. So it's expensive to recover from these events. And if everybody puts those millions of pounds to one side to protect, uh, that would be uh, uh, that would be a hopeless waste of taxpayers' money. There aren't any commercial cyber insurance products that would help us. So um, um, I don't I don't know of any anyway. Uh, so we just need to have this kind of um, self insurance. If everybody puts a few thousand pounds into a central fund, it can help um, councils pay for the cost of reinstall reinstalling all their systems rather than um, uh, rather than expect individual councils to support themselves after such a massive loss uh, through uh, uh, through these attacks um, that's that's my view and hopefully the government might consider helping us set up that kind of uh, fund that's great thank you and i'm just conscious we've only got about four minutes left so if there's any last questions you know do put them in the box um but um you know, curtis um thinking about solutions there are so many technologies available how do uh, public sector bodies identify the best solution? Yeah, this is this is a really difficult one. So certainly as a, as a CISO in, in my previous experience, I had multiple vendors coming up to me on a weekly basis, you know, with the latest silver bullet or the golden unicorn or whatever you want to call it, that was going to fix all of the problems. And that's it's all well and good, but usually it's it's trying to judge exactly what in your attack surface is the weakest the weakest model. I wouldn't recommend spending a penny on any technology solution until you have determined that that particular solution is going to provide a big bang for its buck. Um, so it's kind of doing some kind of even light gap analysis to make sure that you're spending the money in the right area because there are so many tools that you could you can use for different things. You really need to be able to understand okay but what is our weakest part and then to pay, take the money to spend on that part to shore up the defense everybody needs to appreciate that this is a marathon not a sprint we're not all trying to race to some kind of finish line because this isn't going to end this isn't there isn't a, a final point here it's a case of constantly reviewing what we have in place and making sure we have that defense in depth um, we often speak about layered defense but that kind of ends up you can end up with having two belts it's not going to make any difference we need belt and braces it needs to be uh, it needs to be additional additional layers of security so that's part of what we're doing within the cyber center of excellence we're testing a lot of the solutions that we can we can find including stuff that's that's kind of next level technology as invested breed that's that's new out so that then we can try and get them in the large buying power and then provide them actually at a cost effective price so it's trying to take that military level security but give it at a retail price to public authorities that's great, thank you. Uh, we've got one final question before we wrap up. Um, so to anyone on the panel who might be able to answer, um, this one's from Abby. Um, Abby asks, talking of training for staff on cybersecurity, there seems to be a huge amount of courses out there at different levels and prices, and it seems to be a minefield. Are there any resources or training that you would recommend? I don't want to rule the roost, but yeah, but um, so uh, I, would, I would start off by making sure that you that it is NCSC assured training. Um, the reason that that's important is for things when things do go wrong and you are looking at things like insurance or you're speaking to the ICO, they're going to be looking at the level of that training immediately. So it's worthwhile having something that has been assured by the NCSC. And um, certainly via the CCOE, we have a training partner um, that we can we can recommend. So, and likewise, for any other technology, so people are welcome to get in, in touch with us. We can give um, impartial advice um, so that we can kind of look at exactly what your infrastructure is and, and identify it. The other part I'd say is conduct a training needs analysis. There is no point doing GDPR training five years in a row if your focus is not on GDPR. Um, it might be that this year you focus on ransomware simulations and prevention, and then in three months' time you focus on something else. Like Manos said earlier, it, it should be something we're doing frequently, not something that's a one-off uh, once a year kind of uh, kind of training solution. So really look at the investment and also identify things that you can do in-house um, that aren't going to be through a training provider such as round the table exercises. That's really helpful. Is there anything else that anyone would add from their own experience of, of, of training programs? Yeah, Tom? Uh, I, I would just I would just re-emphasize re what um, Curtis and Manos have said about um, the frequency of training. Make sure it's not an annual um, box ticking exercise. Um, you know, uh, vary vary the training. Um, you know, give uh, you know so that people don't get you know people don't get bored by it, but also so that you maximize the um, 
uh, the impact. There's so many different ways um, to, to mount an attack uh, and so many different consequences that we need to make sure that people are, uh, are aware of those um, across the board. And again, and, and re-emphasize this, you know, um, try, try not to have a blame culture um, in, in doing all of that. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. We have run out of time with our panel. Uh, thank you so much to Richard, Tom, Manos and Curtis for sharing their insights, their learned experience um, and their expertise. Uh, we are going to move on now to a keynote speech before we break for lunch. Uh, so we're going to introduce uh, Jonathan Powell, Powell, who was with us in an earlier discussion. discussion. <laughs> uh, let me introduce Jonathan Powell from the National Audit Office with our next keynote speech. Great, thanks very much, Geeta. So as Geeta said, I'm Jonathan, and I'm from the, the NAO, um, and I'm a digital specialist on our digital insights team. So we're a specialist team in the NAO that looks across government, uh, digital data, technology and security matters. And what I'm going to do in this session is just to give you a brief overview of how we see the cybersecurity landscape from our particular perspective of looking across government. Now, hopefully many of you are aware of who we are and the work that we do, but if not, I'll just mention that we're the UK's independent public spending watchdog. So we audit the accounts of central government departments and other bodies and report to Parliament on how they've used their resources to deliver value for money. It's not our role to question the policy objectives, but rather what we're looking at is whether those resources have been used in the best way to deliver value for money and the intended outcomes. We publish around 60 reports a year in total on various topics, and they include digital data and security. And in the last 10 years, we've reported on government cybersecurity four times. Three of those reports were looking at the progress of the various national cybersecurity strategies across the years. And one of those reports was a more specific look at um, protecting information across government. So that was from the perspective of what Cabinet Office were doing to secure government's own information. And uh, the topic of WannaCry just came up briefly in the previous session. And we also did a report on that specifically that hit the NHS in 2017 and I think we, we said what was widely known at the time that NHS was running some fairly old IT and was aware that it was running risks and hadn't heeded previous warnings. Uh, as well as those reports we produce a number of good practice and insight guides um, and two of the more recent ones are on cloud services and cybersecurity and information assurance and you can find those together with all our reports on our website at www.nao.org.uk I should say that these guides aren't intended to be technical implementation guides for practitioners there's plenty of good detailed material around for a specialist audience and for technical professionals um, both from government sources and from external organizations our target with these guides is senior decision makers and those with responsibility for overall governance um, in government, but who in all likelihood don't come from a technical background. Our aim is to demystify cloud and cyber security, firstly by explaining in simple language what they are, and then also setting out the sorts of considerations that organisations should be bearing in mind. And in both of those guides, we provide some suggested key questions that this senior audience might ask of their organization's management. So, for example, at risk and audit committee meetings. And we also signpost the more detailed guidance that's available. So if any of you are looking for resources which could be helpful in getting messages across to your senior management, then those guides that we've produced are well worth a look. Also worth saying that it's not our role as an independent organisation to set out the actual requirements for government. That's the responsibility of Cabinet Office, um, certainly in the central government sector. And then within that, you have various units 
with more specific responsibility for digital data and security matters. So we've got Government Security Group, uh, we've got CDDO, the Central Digital and Data Office, and we heard earlier a speaker on um, Secure by Design from CDDO. And then, of course, it's been mentioned a few times, we have the National Cyber Security Centre, which is the national technical authority on these matters. So that's just a bit about the role of the NAO and where we fit within this, this overall wider picture. I think it's quite interesting to take a brief look back at how the approach to information and cybersecurity in the public sector has evolved over the years, because it helps understand where we are now. Um, and as a spoiler, I think government would be the first to admit that things aren't very good at the moment. The early approach that was taken was very much that of walled gardens and prescriptive rules that departments and other organisations had to follow. Some of you might remember the Government Secure Intranet, or GSI, which launched back in 1998, and that provided basic connectivity between government organisations. It also included local authorities, so on the GSX as it was called, and non-government bodies such as suppliers who were on what was called the GSE. And I mention it because it had a code of connection which organisations needed to sign up to, and this contained all sorts of security requirements that they were supposed to follow. And I say supposed to, because in practice, what we did see were organisations which had what were in reality weak compliance positions and remediation plans with outstanding actions. But although in theory they could have been expelled, we didn't see that happening. But the idea was that if an organisation was on the GSI, then they were a trusted organisation for the purposes of technical exchange of information because they signed up to that code of connections. And the NAO, um, we ourselves were on the GSI because obviously we receive information from all of the organisations we audit. So uh, perhaps we're in a particular privileged position because we hold information on pretty much every other government body. And this approach was mirrored with security products. So CESG, the forerunner of the National Cybersecurity Centre, had an approved product scheme. So for example, a long time, for a long time, the only approved mobile devices in government for email and calendar on the go were Blackberries, remember those. And then when there was a clamp down on making sure that laptops were encrypted, there were specific encryption products that were approved for deployment. So very much um, an approach of um, centrally um, prescribed rules. From about 2012 onwards, the GSI was superseded and overtaken by something called the PSN, uh, which became known as the Public Services Network. And that aimed to be, um, and I'm quoting now from the working group document that set it up, a private network of networks for the public sector addressing the various special security, resilience, service and availability needs of public sector organisations. So still a walled garden, um, and this time with the code of connection being much more rigorously enforced with the principle of no weak links and zero tolerance of security weaknesses. Organisations were expected to demonstrate this time that their network did meet the requirements. Now, a lot found this quite difficult, and I remember at the time that local authorities in particular were starting to question the proportionality of it all. But at the end of 2013, you might recall that there were some press reports that one particular local authority in London, it wasn't actually named, was hours away from being disconnected um, and others were in a similar situation. But what this led to, people began to see the security requirements as somewhat draconian and a barrier rather than an enabler to better sharing of data across government. So what we saw was a move to giving public sector organisations more leeway to assess and manage their own cybersecurity risks. But then, of course, this requires that the people making those sorts of decisions, and particularly at the top of the shop, do so on the basis of being suitably informed, understanding the advice they're given and the implications of their choices. In 2016, uh, we at the NAO published a report called Protecting Information Across Government, and that took stock of how government was progressing with implementing its cybersecurity strategy. 
We set out the cybersecurity landscape at that time, which included what government itself admitted was a complete alphabet soup, that's their phrase, of organisations in the centre of government, which all had overlapping responsibilities for security, and people on the front line found it confusing where to go for advice. At that time, the National Cybersecurity Centre had just been announced and was about to come into being through merging a number of existing organisations, uh, notably CESG, who provided the technical um, assurance earlier. So our overall conclusion then was that we welcomed the direction of travel, but we said that if it was going to make a difference, then departments were going to need effective support and not just be left to their own devices. Technology, of course, never stands still. And during this time, we'd seen the use of cloud services steadily increasing. And in 2017, Cabinet Office changed tack and announced that the PSN was going to be wound down. And to quote from the headline of the announcement, the internet is okay. Government had been encouraging a cloud first strategy since 2013. And this confirmed that with appropriate security measures, public cloud is acceptable for information classified at the official level. So this was quite a change in direction from the vision of the PSN I quoted from earlier, which talked about the special security and resilience needs of the public sector. So we've now moved from a walled garden approach with strict rules to giving departments much more freedom to choose their own solutions and make their own judgments on how much cyber risk they're willing to accept. And while the NCSC was there to provide support, still down to individual departments and organisations to define, develop and deliver their own approach to cyber risk and making sure it's appropriate to their overall operating model and risk appetite. So. Moving on to 2019, uh, we reported again, we looked at the progress on the National Cybersecurity Programme and what we said then was that despite recent improvements in the programme's management and delivery record, it's been established with inadequate baselines for allocating resources, deciding on priorities or measuring progress effectively. By this time, the Government Security Group had been established in 2018 in the Cabinet Office as the central security function for government. And one of GSG's first acts was to commission a review of the state of cybersecurity across government to see how this more devolved approach was working. And to be fair to, to them, the results were not good. Broadly speaking, what it found was that spending on security as a proportion of departments' expenditure limits was low generally. And of that, more was going on physical security rather than cybersecurity measures. And what they also found was that asset management, so knowing what you've got and where it is, supply chain risk management and monitoring and detection capability were all at generally low levels of maturity. So further work was done in 2019 to identify the scale of the security and legacy risk. And we touched on this in our NAO report on the challenges in implementing digital change, where we said that this exercise led to spending review settlements of 600 million in 2020 uh, and 2.7 billion in, in the 2021 review and made recommendations on how government could make progress, reducing its reliance on legacy systems. So what we said at that time is it's positive development that funding's been identified and earmarked, but it's hard to escape the fact that even today, departments are still struggling to meet cybersecurity standards. And this just shows the enormity of the task that we all face. Last year, just before Christmas, we published a report called Modernising Aging Digital Services, and that looked into this in a bit more detail at DEFRA, Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, because they've got quite a large legacy estate. And what we said in that report was that DEFRA's settlement in that 2021 spending review was only 58% of what they asked for, and to quote, from the conclusion is not enough to fund a broader digital transformation of all legacy services or reduce cybersecurity and resilience risks to an acceptable level. So where are we at the moment? The latest government cybersecurity strategy came out last year and that acknowledges there's a significant gap between where government cyber resilience is now and where it needs to be.
uh, and some departments are equally candid. They, they say the same. There's one digital strategy that states, and again, I'm quoting directly, the department currently holds an unacceptable cyber risk position. Extensive cybersecurity gaps exist across the department in people, processes and technology, and it's one of the top three board risks. I won't single out who this is, but it's a, a large department and you get the picture. So I've mentioned the government cybersecurity strategy, and it's welcome that this is the first time a separate strategy for government's been published, because previously it was subsumed within those overall national strategies. And as I said in the past, we've observed these have not been backed up by adequate baselines or means of measurement, and we have previously criticised a lack of focus on execution. So the current strategy is trying to address a number of issues with the approach that's gone before, and three that I, I've heard people talk about is government's overall cyber capability being less than the sum of the parts because of a lack of joined up working, strong standards not being matched, up, matched by an effective assurance process uh, and a lack of metrics to challenge or demonstrate progress over time. So, of course, the strategy now has got two main targets. It's government's critical functions to be significantly hardened by 2025 and then all government organisations across the whole public sector to be resilient to known vulnerabilities and attack methods no later than 2030. That's the headline, but if you look in the detail in Chapter 8, it goes on to imply that the deadline for central government is actually 2026 to meet their um, target cyber assessment profiles and then 2030 for all other organisations. And the new strategy is backed up by Govashore, which is a new stronger assurance regime, and that'll start to report later this year. And one of its features is rather than being based on self-assessment, it will be underpinned by a requirement for objective verification by independent auditors, certainly for some organisations at least. And so we do see this as a positive development. So I just want to end very quickly by saying a few words about cybersecurity skills, uh, and then I'll would not keep you from your lunch. We all know that there's a skills gap uh, and cybersecurity skills are in high demand generally. As you may know, uh, whenever the NAO publishes a report, there's normally a House of Commons Public Accounts Committee evidence session following that. And this week they've published their report on the digital transformation in government addressing the barriers to efficiency study. Now, at that session, the skills gap came up and cybersecurity experts were singled out as one area where it's particularly difficult. And we've heard about that in the panel discussions earlier this morning. So on the one hand, Sorin from Crown Commercial Service mentioned the agreement with hyperscalers for SAF staff training, which sounds very welcome, but then Lee from the NHS spoke about, his phrase was, there's a level of reality we have to expect and accept, and the difficulties from his perspective. So it's really a fair question to ask how the skills shortage, the skills gap is going to be addressed. Um, and there's no easy answers to that one, as I'm, I'm sure you're all aware. So that's a brief overview of the landscape from our perspective uh, and with that I will hand back to Geeta. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Jonathan for that really um, insightful ex expert analysis of the situation at the moment. Uh, so that was Jonathan Powell from the National Audit Office. So we are going to break for lunch now but just just to mention um, how important this subject is, we've just seen some breaking news that Manchester Evening News is reporting that Greater Manchester Police have been the victim of a huge hack in which thousands of warrant card details have been stolen. So that's what the Manchester Evening News is reporting. But you know, a, a, a real example, a real life example of why getting across cybersecurity is so important. So we are going to have a break now for lunch so that you can recharge your batteries. We'll be back at 2pm for our next panel, which is on human error. Hope to see you then.